Good afternoon and welcome to the 10th session of our uh, doctoral seminar series. Uh, my name is Dominique Samda. I'm a research fellow at HUMA at the, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. The seminar is streaming on Facebook and you will find a recording of the session um, on the HUMA YouTube channel. To ensure the safety of the session, we are asking participants to please include their full names in this Zoom room. Um, you might find yourselves temporarily placed in the waiting room otherwise. So please, please rename yourself. In the doctoral seminar series, we, we invite our guests to reflect on the challenges and strategies of doctoral work with a particular focus on the turning points and critical experiences that shape their research journey. Our speaker today, my colleague, Ralph Borland, has chosen the following title for the session, Pursuing an ID, the unfolding of a PhD project. Dr. Ralph Borland is a junior research fellow at Huma. He's a researcher and an artist, curator and interdisciplinary knowledge worker. He has a degree in fine art from uh, the University of Cape Town, a master in interactive telecommunication from New York University, his PhD, his PhD is from Trinity College uh, in Dublin, uh, and this PhD is a critic of first world design interventions in the developing world. His postdoctoral work at UCT focused on the African city and north-south knowledge inequalities. He has uh, a keen interest in the democratization and creative use of emerging technologies. African Robots is, uh, is a project and um, a collaboration with street wire artists in Southern Africa. Uh, and this project introduced electronics and mechanics to their practice. His art design piece uh, suited for subversion uh, that was uh, completed in 2002, uh, a protective and performance suit for, for street protest um, is uh, exhibited in the New York Museum of Modern Art um, uh, in, the, in the permanent uh, collection. He also co-curated the exhibition Design and, and Violence at um, Science Gallery uh, Dublin in 2016 and uh, Future Present Design in a Time of Urgency at Science Gallery Detroit in 2020. And finally, he is a selected artist uh, on the Dakar Biennale 2022. Uh, so many uh, uh, achievements and very, very diverse practice. So um, Ralph, Ralph Borland, please, um, you know, you have the floor. Welcome to the, to the doctoral seminar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dominique, for that introduction. And uh, it's uh, it's fun to be on this side of the of the of the Zoom screen, seeing as I also host my own uh, weekly weekly seminar series. So thank you very much. Hi to my colleagues and welcome to everyone else who's here. Um, I'm going to do my best to recount my PhD experience uh, with an eye to exploring the context around it. You know how how did I get the idea to study what I did for my PhD? How did I move from having an idea about something to having an argument or a thesis um, and how did I complete my PhD? Uh, what, did I, what did I do to, to, to try and bring it to completion? So um, I'm going to share my screen. I've just got a graphical presentation and I've got one little animation that I'll show along the way. Uh, let me just go to my screen share. So do you see a screen that says uh, pursuing an idea? Yes, yes, always, always good, Ralph. Good, great. So um, let me just move this so that I can see it at the same time as you. OK, still good? Let's, let's go. So I've, I've subtitled my presentation, The Unfolding of a PhD Project, and I've I've given, I've created this little graphic here for the presentation, which literally is a, an, like an unfolding piece of paper, like a map, perhaps, when you open up a map and you unfold it to see what the whole terrain is. I think the interesting thing about doing a PhD is you start out having some idea of what you're doing, but it's only at the end when you've completed it that you can look back and see what the whole process was, how you got to the end of it. 
And I've divided up the idea of this unfolding into before, so before you start your PhD, three stages of the PhD, the beginning, the middle, and the end, and then after, you know, what comes after the PhD. So this is the structure I'll follow for, for this presentation. So before, um, I started out as a fine arts student at the University of Cape Town studying sculpture. And these are my final year works in 1997. I produced these uh, large scale uh, sculptures that ex I exhibited in a train yard uh, and they had uh, multiple sound circuits uh, that I was DJing through. So I combined an interest in technology, uh, sound, installation, sculpture, and sites. You know, I, I found the site of an old train yard that I exhibited in. Um, so this is the, my background in fine art in Cape Town. And I then moved to New York um, at the end of the 90s in 1999, and I started my master's in a program called the Interactive Telecommunications Program, where I learned how to use new technologies for art. Ralph, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, I, yeah. I, we, I think we don't see what you want uh, us to see. We see a, a, a white line. Okay. okay, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, do I have to move it there? Okay, yeah, there's something going on with it. Okay, do you see it now? Did, yes. Do you see this previous slide? No, we okay. just saw the, the title. The, the title. Okay, so um, quick recap. <laughs> <laughs> The unfolding of a PhD project. I'm not sure if you saw this diagram here. Um, I'm dealing with the idea of a before the PhD, the beginning, the middle, and the end of it, and the after. And this diagram is a bit like a map that you unfold to see what the whole terrain is. Okay. Um, before starts with my um, first degree in fine art and sculpture. And these were uh, large scale sculptures with sound uh, systems inside them. It's an interest that continues to this day is this, uh, this idea of large scale sculpture incorporating sound. And because of my interest in technology, I took up my master's at New York University's interactive telecommunications program, where I produced interactive artwork like these suits that are performance suits that blow up in response to your voice and they allow you to posture like animals. So the, one con the context that leads up to my PhD work is in part my academic, my academic background. Um, my undergrad in sculpture, my master's in uh, interactive telecommunications. The other thing that I was doing when I was living in New York, and this is talking about the other kinds of context for your work, is I was taking part in large scale street protests. And these are images from what was the anti globalization movement of the late 90s and early 2000s, which were protests against corporate globalization and bodies like the World Trade Organization as well as anti-war protests. I was living in New York uh, during September 11th, before and after, and I got uh, very involved in anti-war protests as well. But especially the anti-globalization -globa protests were these mass movements that united trade unionists with, with, with anarchists, with environmental groups, with workers. They were very broad. Uh, they incorporated large numbers of people and they had a real diversity of tactics within these street protests. So you'd have tens of thousands of people in the streets of Washington and Seattle and in Argentina and around the world uh, protesting uh, these globalization politics. And out of these movements, tactics emerged. And on the top right here, you see protesters who are wearing crash helmets and life jackets and white overalls. They're called the white overalls movement and they wore armor to protests. And you can still see some of these tactics in play in protests today, like in Europe. On the bottom right is the black bloc. Uh, this, this, this is from 20 years ago, but it, you'd see it now in the States in, uh, and in the presence of Antifa, the anti-fascist movements. So they're kind of wear black and red, have a kind of a glamorous image, and they engage themselves in property destruction and some form of violence. Um, and then on the lower left are the radical clown army. So these are people who dress up in a carnivalesque way to go to protests, and they use humor and spectacle and performance in protests. And these are some of the, some of the tactics that are used in, in protests. I was taking part in, in these protests and I made an artwork in response to my experience. So I made a, a piece called Suited for Subversion, which was a, a riot suit to wear to demonstrations to protect me from the police, but also to draw attention to myself. And uh, it incorporates a speaker and a pulse reader and it projects my heartbeat out of my body. So people around me can hear my heart. And if I'm excited or scared, they'll hear my pulse rate increasing 
And I visualized, you know, having numbers of people wearing these together and going to protests and wearing them at, uh, at protests. And it's called Suited for Subversion. Um, I, I feel like it's a bit of a, a clownish statement as well as it's protecting your body. Disarming armor is how I talk about it. And uh, that was in 2002. It was my master's uh, thesis work. Uh, so that was the work I did to complete my master's. And 2005, it was selected for an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York um, and put on show there. And then they subsequently bought it for the collection. And it's been seen by hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of people in the years intervening. This, this project really had me thinking about this combination of function and communication in objects. I thought, well, I've designed this suit in response to my experience. It's meant to have a function to protect you at a protest and to create a spectacle. Um, it honestly isn't very good at doing that. You know, I wore it, you know, so like it's, it's actually quite uncomfortable. You don't feel very safe wearing it. Uh, it doesn't really protect your like legs and your arms. It was more of a statement than it was a real functional piece, but through getting put on exhibition at the MoMA, celebrated through magazines and newspapers and TV shows, um, it reached a huge audience who were really interested in what it suggested. You know, it suggested this cheeky subversion, this, this uh, method of resistance, this way of engaging with messages around protest. And so I thought, well, I've created something which has an immediate function for the user, but that's not really its primary function. The primary function is to communicate to audiences about the context that it comes from. And that, that led me directly into my PhD work. So if I start at the beginning of my PhD work, I applied to a program at Trinity College Dublin in an engineering department uh, who were looking at combinations of technology and activism. So I thought I'm gonna go to this program and I'd like to explore this area more. I started calling the area that I was working in provocative technology, uh, the idea that you can have tools and technologies that have immediate functions for resistance or activism, um, but they're also about communicating to audiences. And so my initial title was Radical Plumbers and Play Pumps, Pragmatic and Provocative Tools for Social Change. And the two things that I was twinning there was the play pump, which was a South African invention that was a children's roundabout that pumps water. And they, uh, they sell advertising to billboards to raise money for the maintenance of the pump. And then the other um, poll that I was looking at, the other end of the spectrum, was the radical anti-privatization movements in South Africa, the anti-privatization forum who were uprooting prepaid water meters from where they were installed in their communities, returning them to the mayor's house in Joburg, for example, and asserting the right to free water. So you have these two different projects that are both to do with supplying water. One of them is a design for development piece, uh, the play pump. You know, it suggests that you can have children's play produce this daily necessity. And the other is this resistant uh, activist project, which says the water is there in the pipes, the government and companies are preventing us from getting it by privatizing it and by charging us for its use. We, you know, we, we, we have a right to water and we can, we can uproot these prepaid meters and get access to them. So this was my loose idea was I thought, you know, I'm an, I'm an artist who's engaged with activism. I understand something about how objects communicate and about how tools can have many functions, including communication to audiences. I looked particularly at the play pump that became the main case study of my work. It was interesting because I started in 2006 when the play pump was at its height of popularity. I suspected from the start that something that was this good of a storyteller, you know, children in Africa playing on a, on a roundabout and it produces water and it claims to solve the problem of water provision. I thought this is too good to be true. This looks like an artwork to me. It doesn't look like a real development project. In fact, it got tens of millions of dollars of funding from the US government and from a range of private sources, and it never really worked properly. That's, how, that's what was revealed over the course of my PhD um, study. I started to look at the area around the play pump, which is designed for the other 90% or designed for the developing world. Objects like the life straw here, which is depicted, um, where uh, Companies produce novel objects for getting people access to water and electricity and basic needs. Housing is another area. Um, I was really interested in how through image and video and advertising campaigns, these objects communicated themselves to audiences. Again, coming from art, I'm thinking these things are a bit like art objects. You know, they, they've got this very strong narrative storytelling symbolic component to them. Um, I looked then at art, actual art projects that are 
borderline uh, design projects. So Brinko, for example, by the Argentinian artist Judy Vertine, she designed shoes for border jumpers. So they're custom designed sneakers that were distributed to Mexican border jumpers to help them to illegally cross the border into the United States. They had maps of the border regions and the sole of the shoe. They had a compass incorporated into them and they had symbols of Mexican pride on the shoes. And she funded the project by selling them in boutique art stores, uh, boutique shoe shops and art stores in America on the other side of the border and then distributed them for free to migrants. And it created a huge media controversy where she was interviewed by Fox News and all of these American TV channels about why is she abetting uh, illegal immigration. So she created an object that was about stimulating debate. And I looked at um, artists like Michael Rakovitz, who designed shelters for homeless people that are designed to be placed in public spaces and call attention to homelessness and the desire of homeless people to be uh, in public rather than um, put in homeless shelters. And I looked at artists like Childo Morales, the Brazilian artist who in the 1970s under the military dictatorship in Brazil was uh, printing messages onto Coke bottles that then went back into circulation and carried political messages on them, like how to turn this bottle into a petrol bomb or Yankees go home. So some of his messages were, he had a, he had a project called Insertions into Ideological Circuits, where he talks about how can artists get messages out into the public without using the media. Um, so I started to produce this cluster of examples. I was looking at design, at art, at design for the developing world, at critical design, at activist practices, very broad. Um, and I was going, what's happening in this area? And right at the beginning, I started to list all of these areas. I was like, I'm looking at the politics of technology. I'm looking at activism, architecture. Um, in terms of my goals, and as I, I say here, a hint of method because like, um, methods are things that I kind of, I'm a bit of a magpie uh, in an academic sense. I sort of pick uh, the bright and shiny things that I see around and assemble hybrid methodologies from areas around me. But uh, I'm saying, what are my goals here? Very, very broad goals. That's part of what I want to convey in this presentation is the progress of a PhD from, this is from the first few months of my, of my three or four year PhD process, where I'm going, I want to do everything. I want to do everything that I can within this area. Um, to develop projects in collaboration with others, to compile case studies, to produce manuals, to challenge policymakers. Too much to do. Um, and these are some of my expected themes, decentralization, north-south differences, the role of the artist, technology development, questioning a profit-based culture. So an ambitious and broad spread. And this is what my abstract looked like at the beginning of my PhD where I'm looking at this broad area of tools and technologies designed to have a symbolic communicative or agitational function, as well as a more direct material function. Um, and the first task of the thesis is to define this area. Um, and then I stay really quite broad. Um, what space possibility or need is there for the aesthetic, symbolic or agitational in technology for the developing world? This thesis identifies the need for critical evaluation of development technology and shows how a provocative technology approach might enable this. Okay, so any of you out there who are doing PhDs um, might uh, relate to the frustration that you feel in the first, I don't know, year of doing a PhD, where you have a, an interest in an area but you're not quite sure how to turn it into a question or an argument or a thesis. And from my experience, you keep trying and you might have your supervisor keep telling you, no, you don't have it yet. And you're like, but I don't, I don't get it. How do, how do I do it? Um, uh, and it's funny now being 10 years after my PhD, because at the time of doing my PhD, it feels like something that you'll never finish because it's such like a huge task that you're faced with, but trust me, you, you, you can. Um, so, we get into the middle of the PhD process where the first part is I've got these interests that come from my real life experience. I've like activism. I've got this academic background to do with art and technology um, and design, you know, but how, what do I do with it? So in the middle um, is where I start to map things out. I go like, well, what order am I going to put these things in? What's the movement of my thesis? Um, I'm going to look at this idea of provocative technology, I'm looking at design for debate, which is a particular area. I'm looking at design for the developing world. I'm starting to try and map these areas out. Then 
this is a diagram that start that indicates something where I'll swap to another screen for just briefly. But um, what I did halfway through my thesis is I started to assemble the example projects. These are some of the art projects I was looking at. And I started to lay them out in a kind of pseudo three dimensional way on, on terrains. I thought I started to think symbolically. I thought I'm looking at an area. This area was represented by this oval that I have here. And then I have these projects that are within them. And how am I going to use these projects? So let me um, have a look for the little the structural um, thing that I was doing here. OK, so what I did for my supervisor is I created a little animation. Um, and I'm going to click through this. So it doesn't not, not that important if you can't see the text. but I'm, I'm, I'm describing my chapter structure, introduction. So you have described this in this way. Um, my second chapter is going to talk about this broad area of object solutions. This gray oval represents this area. You know, what is this thing? Then I start to introduce these examples within it, these little dotted line circles within the structure. Yeah, the first chapter is going to talk about design for development, uh, you know, design for development objects. So I'm starting to think in terms of domains. What are the different domains that I'm looking at? How can I divide things out? And each one is based on a set of five examples. I'm studying the central area of design for the developing world. But what else am I looking at on the side, which starts to inform that? You know, I get into critical design as an area. I start to look at every, I intend to look at everyday practices. I don't end up using this in my thesis very much, but I'm starting to build out, you can, you can see in this graphical way, these examples. And then I pay attention to each one in turn, is what I'm indicating. Um, and then I have this, I'm, I'm sort of starting graphically to try and represent my whole thesis as an image. Then I have this ambition, which again doesn't uh, doesn't really happen. That I'm going to use economics development studies to like uh, to to look at it, start to get this whole like complex mesh of uh, of of influences. Out of these, I produce an analysis for each of these five central case studies. Then I analyze the area more generally. I make recommendations, and this is my final uh, slide for the my this idea of structure halfway through my thesis which is that this area which I first defined as this kind of neat oval containment, I now reveal to be much more porous with porous boundaries that incorporate research from other fields. And I gain a different understanding of the shape of the area. So that's as strange as it might seem out of context, this, this sort of process, my supervisor found it really helpful in terms of um, being able to, let's see, in terms of being able to understand what I was doing. And I found it helpful as well in terms of get, gaining some understanding of what I was doing. So I'm a graphical thinker. It's part of how, how I work. I also started to produce um, drawings of the plate pump itself, like looking at the structure of it. Um, so I did these sketches. I went to the trouble of like getting my pencil crayons out and like coloring in my sketches, because that's for me is part of what motivates me to do the, to do the work is being creative with it. And out of that, I end up with diagrams, understanding how the play pump works that go into my thesis at the end that look like that. Um, and I start doing like chronological sort of timelines of the development of the play pump. And basically the movement that happens within the journey of my PhD, the unfolding of it is that I go from thinking I'm gonna write about an entire area that I'm making up that, that you know, draws across many, many domains. I, I go to, okay, I'm gonna do five case studies from design for development. Okay, actually I'm gonna do one case study, which is the play pump. And part of what helped me to, to realize what I needed to do was that I was teaching at the time and I was teaching um, fourth year students in undergrad. Uh, I was supervising their production of their little mini theses and they, they had to produce 10,000 word theses. And I thought to myself, um, let me go through to this is the, the end part that will help to indicate. This, this, this is a map of my chapter structure of my thesis and how it works. And this was quite influenced by my teaching students how to write 10,000 word theses. And then when I, when I read their theses, I, was, I could really get a sense of what can you do in 10,000 words, you know, and, and that each of their theses could correspond to a chapter in my thesis, because I had a 100,000 word limit for my, for my thesis, which I, which I reached. And I had um, about 10 chapters. And so I thought, well, each of my chapters can be about 10,000 words. 
And each of my chapters is like one of the theses that the undergrad students I'm teaching um, are doing. And actually, what you can do within that 10,000 words is quite limited. You, you, you have to introduce the evidence, you have to reflect on it, you have to analyze it, you have to have some mini conclusion about it. And there's only so much you can do. So it really helped me to get a sense of the scale of the written document. And that's really what the end of the thesis process is about, is writing it up. I took a year to write up my findings, just sitting in the library every day, writing it. And what this diagram is, which is in my thesis, it's in the introduction to my thesis, is it explains how the thesis works. So my chapter one is the introduction where I describe what's happening. My chapter two is about design for development, that field. Chapter three is about appropriate technology. Chapter four is about interventionist art. Chapter five is about critical design. Chapter six is about anti-programs, which is activist uh, movements. And then you can see that I'm indicating arrows, like for example, design for development and appropriate technology get used to analyze the play pump in chapter seven, the first time. Then the three chapters that are about art, critical design and activist programs go to analyze the play pump again in chapter eight. So I have two different chapters that both analyze the play pump using different lenses. And then in my conclusion, I bring all of those things together and I produce a way of understanding. I'll come back to that. Uh, I produce an analytical tool which says, I've analyzed the play pump through using all of this ra these ranges of approaches from different domains. Um, I've now produced a tool that you can use to analyze other objects that are like that. And my abstract, where we saw the previous, uh, my previous abstract, which had the ambition of describing a domain, which I called provocative technology. Now the first sentence of my abstract is, this thesis analyze the, analyzes the play pump, a water pump powered by a children's roundabout, which is designed for use in the developing world. And the play pump is analyzed as an example of design for development, an area of current design attention to the, to the developing world. Um, and I talk about the play pump for the majority of my, of my thesis. Um, and then I talk about the combined perspectives, which, uh, which help to reveal how it works. And then in conclusion to the thesis, the arguments produced around the play pumps prioritizing of first world audiences over developing world users are applied to the broader field of design for development identifying the risks in its ways of operating. In closing, a broader view of objects and development is proposed. Disciplinary gaze, which was brought to the analysis of the play pump. So I advocate, I advocate for, the, uh, for the use of these multiple domains. And after, just to conclude, what happens after your PhD? I mean, I was looking back at some emails that I wrote to friends during the end of my PhD in which I was saying, I'm realizing how much more I want to find out and how much more I have to write about. And that actually the thesis I've produced is just a slice of, of what I've unearthed during my process. And so it led to the immediate uh, next step after my, after my thesis was handed in was I curated an exhibition about the future of water at, uh, at a gallery at Trinity College Dublin. So I used my research into water technology to curate an exhibition. I then uh, took up a postdoctoral post in Cape Town at the African Center for Cities, uh, where, which was my first postdoc, where I was looking at Cape Town as world design capital. So my work in design for my PhD then brought me into a postdoc that was looking critically at design. Um, I've transitioned into a second postdoc on a project called Global Arenas of Knowledge, and this is the abstract of a paper we wrote for an MIT press journal called Global Environmental Politics. Um, and this was, this was advocating the idea of agency from the South in the context of North-South knowledge inequality. And this is one of my ambitions at the beginning of my PhD was to, was to work in this area. So I found myself after my PhD in this area. And of course, Bringing us up to the present day, I am now a researcher at Humor uh, this year, and I'm working on uh, the role of emerging technologies in Africa, especially artificial intelligence in, in healthcare. Um, and this is drawing on my background in art and technology, as well as ways of critiquing North-South relationships and, uh, and design interventions, or, or the politics of technology more, more broadly. Um, and that's, that's it. I think that's right now. That's up to right. We're talking about now. <laughs> thanks Tom thank you so much Ralph um, yeah no, it, thank you for the fascinating kind of uh, archaeology of your own um, process 
you know, since, since I've, I've, you know, uh, started working with you, I, I wanted to ask you a question about, you know, knowing that you are, you have like those two hats of being an artist and being a, a scholar, a researcher, somebody who is writing papers and dissertation and talking in conferences. Um, I was wondering, you know, what are the differences um, that exist for you in the experience and process of, you know, conducting um, an art project collaboratively or alone and um, conducting a research project from beginning to end. And so that's the question that, you know, I've been wanting to ask you for forever. But then like, like <laughs> listening to you, watching your uh, drawing and everything, I was like, actually, is, you, you, this, those are not separate uh, kind of adventures. You are, you are doing uh, research as an artist. And like looking at you, like the way you, the way I see you processing uh, the information and organizing your 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 discourse is very very different from oh I oh I do things right you you, you think very, very specially and you you present also um, you present and communicate to others as an artist so I would want to you know to start you know uh, having your thought about that about how you articulate those two facets yeah. that are one in a way. yeah yeah no, thank you dom thanks for your reflection on on my on my presentation and my process um i think that for one thing um I'm, i've been fortunate to have always followed my desires my interests so that um i I, I st I've studied things that I want to find out more about. So at each stage of my education, uh, I've gone, you know, I'm interested, I'm, I'm interested in art. I did an undergraduate in fine art. I'm interested in finding out more about how we can use computers creatively and technology creatively. So I did my master's in that area. And uh, for my PhD, I had this offer of, you know, working in an engineering department as an artist with a supervisor who wants to work with, with artists. And I want to find out more about that area, so I'm doing it. So I think that that's a really fortunate position to be in, to not be, you know, thinking that you have to do something or do something in a certain way. It's like it's a genuine interest and desire which which drives to me. And I think that you know find your voice um, or express yourself that um i also think that free I don't. Um, hmm. I, I am not hearing Ralph. Uh, it might have connections issues. I wasn't sure it, if it was on, on my side, but apparently it's, um, this is Ralph. Um, so we are going to wait a few seconds to see if he's able to connect. Let me check with him. Hi, Dom. Oh, okay, you're back. Okay, <laughs> I was texting you. Yes, sorry. I think you, you you were breaking for the last minutes of so we didn't hear what you what your response was. Just the last few minutes. Yeah. Um. Hopefully, maybe maybe I should stop my video. Yes. Don't. Yeah. That, that's, okay. that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So. 
yeah, I think that um, working in working as an artist, something that I felt early on in, in my undergrad de degree was that artists can do anything. There are less disciplinary constraints around us. So we're able to bring a kind of analytical, critical, creative eye to material and, and also use our, our artist skills to communicate to audiences, you know, to communicate to a public or to specific groups. Um, so I've always felt from the beginning of, of, my, of my studies that this is a real freedom that is within the domain of art and that it gives me the kind of privilege of um, accessing knowledge from a very broad perspective where I'm not constrained by the rules of one particular discipline. And I think that that's something that I, you know, is again, maybe a sort of a characteristic of the kind of artist I am or the kind of art that I do is that artists in the 20th or 21st century are suspicious of doctrine, you know, so we don't like to do things just because we're supposed to do them a certain way. And I think that in academia, there's always that tension around you're supposed to do things according to a certain method or there's certain rules about how you must do something. And as an artist, we're taught to question rules and to question form and to come up with our own forms and our own ways of doing things. So I think when you bring that into the academic space, you can produce some really interesting work. Um, at the same time, I have a commitment to evidence and rationality and argument and ethics. So all of those things still apply to the work that I do. And I'd also say that I'm a, I'm a boundary worker in that I'm not an artist who stays in their studio, you know, making art for themselves. I'm someone who's really interested in popular art and communicating to audi wide audiences and getting my work into the mass media and that's, that's the kind of work that I'm interested in, in doing. So I'm on the boundary of art and many other fields. Yeah, th thank, you. thank you so much. I, I would have um, a follow-up question, but I'm going to open the, uh, the floor now for questions. Um, we already have a question from Angelique, and I just, as a reminder, you can either type your question in the chat or, um, or raise the, um, the kind of virtual hand. Uh, and let us know uh, what your question is. Uh, Angelique, uh, would you want me to read your question or could you um, unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Thanks, Tom. Um, Ralph, thank you for your talk. Um, I just said in the chat that I find it incredible to see how you've merged the academic and creative space using art to tell the story of your approach and findings, um, as it also opens up doors to engage with different audiences. And I guess as somebody who likes dabbling in the creative side and want to figure out how to merge the two, what advice would you give um, for how to do that, basically, and to engage with multiple audiences in that way, as someone who's starting out a PhD? Um, maybe, maybe just the, the first thought would be, <coughs> excuse me, um, general, the general advice of questioning doctrine. Um, so I think, you know, the, there's, we're taught that there are certain ways we have to do things and that if you, if you come up through, I'm guessing, cause I haven't done it, but if you come up through sociology or anthropology, um, or any like any of the humanities fields, um, I get the impression that there are, you know, methods and rules that you're taught very early about what you, how you should do things. And it, or similarly, if you're doing engineering or science subjects, you're also taught about the ways you should do things. Now, in art, we're also taught about how to do stuff, but we're also taught the strong strand of suspicion and questioning and, you know, question the frame, like, why do you have a rectangular frame for your painting? To give you like a very, you know, sort of straightforward example, then you go, well, let me try an odd shape for my frame, you know, because why do I need to do it the same way everyone else is doing it? So I think to, to feel like one can bring that questioning nature to the very structure of what you're doing. I think that the 20th century of art has been a lot about questioning structure and form. So you don't just look within the frame, you look at the frame and you look at the systems that you're working within. Um, 
And so that would be one way I'd think of bringing artistic thinking into your process would be to question the frames and the structures that you're working, working with. And I would also think of using creative methods like, di I mean, I find diagramming very, very useful, you know, like in terms of drawing and diagramming things out. Um, and maybe this is a bit tangential, but I think that collaboration is is also really useful and i think that that's something that actually in art and in academia it's a challenge that we need to present to those institutions is to to really value collaborative work because in the history of art there's quite an emphasis on the solitary artist um, in the 20th century of art there's more emphasis on collectivism and collaboration um, and in academia i think as well like humor humor emphasizes collaboration and collectivism um, but it's challenging, I think, uh, how academia has been, which is perhaps less less collaborative. Thank you, thank you so much for for, for this. Um, please, please don't hesitate to ask to ask question um, uh, to Ralph now. You know, one of the questions that I wanted, and I'm just <laughs> because nobody is asking a question right now. I'm going to ask the question that I had, and that actually you touch on, just like you know the idea of collaboration that is so important in your work. Also, the, the question of participation. Um, what you know you, you just say that you 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 would want to like bring also more of, of um the habit the habit of collaborating into into academia and i know yeah. that you also very attached and invested in participative uh, methods so would you could you say like uh, what what your like um experience as an artist um and your collaborative experience uh, have brought uh, to you in terms of perspective of collaboration and participation and what how 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 we should do better um hmm. yeah in those areas yeah i mean i think i think experience is the main thing really i think that in terms of working with others it's only been uh literally decades of work uh, with others that's that's led to a smoother way of doing it um because i I started out actually in my undergraduate degree, we had loose collectives with my fellow students, but especially in my master's program, it was a requirement for most of our classes that we worked in groups and they didn't, we didn't choose the people we worked with. So we had to work out how to work in groups together. Um, and I, I, I just really love uh, collaborative work with when, when it gels, you know, because yourself and even one other person, even just a partnership, can produce so much more than you could by yourself and when you start to expand to larger collective groups um, it's just amazing the ideas that you come up with that you wouldn't have thought of by yourself and also it just speaks to us as social creatures you know that it's quite hard to do work by yourself and i think it's one of the real challenges of academia is that writing is solitary work largely so you know the last year of my phd was literally going to the library every morning and spending the whole day there writing without my internet connection so that I couldn't be distracted. And I spent most of a year doing that. And it's it's really hard work and it's lonely work. Um, so anything that you can do to form collaborative and collective bonds with others, I think just really, really helps you to make it more fun and more productive. Um, and I, I like working in teams now on art projects as well, where you can be a bit like a film crew, where you have people who have different specializations coming together to produce one, one project. Um, and it requires, I guess, a certain amount of openness and transparency uh, in order to work with others and to try and reduce your defensiveness. Um, and I think that's something that teaching has also taught me. So I've also always taught, uh, in fact, the last few years has been the, the first time that I haven't had a regular teaching gig. And I think what teaching should teach you is how to be less defensive because um, you need to really acknowledge the gaps in your knowledge and the mistakes that you make um, and model for your students uh, a kind of open, humble approach to, to, to knowledge. So yeah, I think, I think, I don't know how I would have done my academic work without also having my teaching work because I think that learning and, and what you can do as well. 
Thank you so much for, for this. Um, we have a question uh, from Divine, uh, I think. Uh, although there's, there's a, a message below that might indicate that it's not from Divine, but Divine, do, was it your question? It's not from me, it's from uh, Rabba. I ah, okay. the name below, yeah, thanks. Okay, Somehow okay. it seems like it doesn't allow people to post. Uh, Okay, I, I understand. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to read a question unless um, uh, Adiba would want to ask the, the, the question, but okay, I'm posing and then, okay, I'm asking the question. So, uh, Ralph, uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, can you comment on the collaborative relationship between student and supervisor? And what was your experience of establishing your agency within the, that doctrine-based relationship? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, so, for one thing, I mean, I really have a I really, you know, like my love. Then maybe I could say my supervisor, because she's my friend by now, from you know from uh, you know 10, 10, 15 years or more of knowing her, uh, Linda Doyle. She's a very special person she's an engineer who wants to work with artists and she has a chair of arts and engineering at trinity college so uh so someone that i remain close to and you and it's ideally you develop those close relationships with your supervisor but um still the process was 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 difficult doing a phd uh in that trinity had a very traditional phd model which is basically that you're on your own for most of it and that you need to come up with the goods meet with your supervisor when you can and then produce this written document at the end whereas my master's program was highly structured you know we we, we had taught classes um we had like three or four modules per semester where we learned about really interesting stuff and we worked with others um, and worked in groups and I'm, I'm really in favor of the idea of a structured phd program as well and um, i know there's interest in this institution with that and I've seen examples of it at, at other institutions where there's a lot of teaching and supervised work and structure to, to the work. And I think that makes it a lot, a lot easier. But my supervisor did do things like she introduced me to colleagues who were artists and that they became co-supervisors. So she, she recognized how to bring resources to the relationship that would help me to, to do my work. Um, and she also found the financial resources to pay for my last year of my PhD because I had scholarships for um, the first three years from South African, from the National Art, uh, from the National Research Foundation, the NRF, and from the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust. So they paid for my first three years of my PhD, um, but I needed another year to write it. I couldn't finish it within those three years. So uh, my supervisor found the funds in her department to to pay for my uh, fees and my living costs for, uh, for my final year. And that was actually essential. I don't think I would have been able to do it without that. So that was a very practical piece of help that she, she was able to give me from the department. Um, and yeah, that was like a solid, solid year of writing. So, and finding agency, yeah, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because in the first part of your PhD, you are, in a position where you don't really know how to judge where you are. Um, and as I said, the frustration of, of keeping on thinking that you, you've got it, where you come back to your supervisor or to a supervisory board and you say, okay, I think I've got my argument now. Now I know what my thesis is. And they're like, no, you still don't have it. And you're like, but what do you mean? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know how this works. And, and they, so you are in a, when you talk about finding agency, you're not in a position in the first year or two to actually be able to evaluate it for yourself. So there's quite a bit of, I think, trust involved of going, I might be frustrated. I might like go through periods of hating the situation that I'm in, but I have got to keep working and I've got to keep pushing through. And eventually you find that agency through work. And I think that's something that's really interesting is that the language of work is work. You know, the more work you can put in, the more that you can demonstrate your commitment to it, then the more that other people will reward you within that structure to do it. And it was only through going through that really lengthy, intensive process that I was able to get somewhere with it. But yeah, I was very fortunate to have a really great um, supervisor and also to have her connect me to other people that helped to make this, uh, to really help to make it possible. Thank you. Thank you, Raf. Um, is there any, any more questions? Um, 
I just wanted to add into like comments on on you know what you just said. Uh, this this is true. Like I hear that I hear in what you say, like the the kind of like um, humility and confidence that you have to gain through uh, through the process, and and uh, you know um, the kind also of um, arrogance such insecurity that you have to overcome. And I think that's very, that's very common. Like we, we as when, when we are uh, PhD candidates, we are both extremely, in a way, like extremely sure of, of, of what we want, of what we do, of what we are and extremely insecure. And both are ex uh, like great obstacles. And, and we have to, to learn to, to have a more like, a, I don't know, solid humility that allow us just to progress and to, to learn. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th I think that um, you're reminding me too of, of particularly in art school in undergrad, which is part of the role the institution plays is something to push against for students. So um, it helps you to define yourself when you're resisting and combating the, um, the institution. And you know, I can say to art students, Look, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling angry. That's actually part of what is meant to happen. You know, that you're, you're pushing back against it is part of how you're going to, you're going to learn and develop. Um, and so we, yeah, those relationships are set up to help us, help, help us develop to, to, to some extent. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. That's, uh, yeah. That, that when, when the relationship is good, it, it absolutely helps the, the maturing. So, Okay, so we have a provocative question from from Divine. Divine, yeah. <laughs> you want to expand on it, or do you want me to to, to read it? Uh, uh, thank you, Dominique. I, I try to not uh, expand on it because it's it's okay. a very it's a provocative question, just to oh, push around okay. the, and the uh, provocateur. You're pushing my buttons. Yes, so, yes. Uh, thank thank you for. Your, your brilliant talk and uh, really inspiring. And it helps us to also understand your journey and you know what it means you know, to think through a project, to work with a supervisor, you know, to, to translate that you know, into, uh, into a text. Uh, and, and, and this is a question that we keep pushing just uh, to uh, deepen reflection in this series. You know, why, you know, there, there's a lot of talk also about mental, health, there's a lot of talk about stress, a lot of talk about uh, people fighting with supervisors, there's a lot of talk about disciplinary borders and boundaries, and also why this series is, uh, attracts a lot of attention is also because we're all struggling with uh, uh, putting together writing, especially this PhD and the dissertation, and, 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 and perhaps to answer that question, we like to pose this same question, why, what is the PhD good for? Why, why is it so important that uh, we, we do this PhD? And, and, and just to also provide the context of decolonization and uh, lots of uh, talk about rethinking uh, the, this format, you know, why, why, why should we be spending seven years, sometimes eight years, sometimes 10 years, sometimes 15 years, you know? Uh, to write this thing. And I see people producing 600 pages, others 400 pages, you know, uh, and many relationships broke down, you know, many uh, uh, people get into all sorts of situations. Why is it so important uh, that we continue to pursue this thing? And why is it good for? And, and I think it will help all of us again, reflect about this journey and what we are doing in this journey. Uh, thank you, Dominique. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, so is that is that my is that my question to answer? The why 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 do it or why is it important? Um, yeah, well, for one thing, I think as you know, as, a, as as part of what I was saying, it's it was quite personal for me. You know, I I I saw the PhD space as an opportunity to learn more about something that I was interested in. So I felt quite personally motivated to go. I, I'm I'm going to get something out of this that I that I that I that I want. Uh, once you're in it, you never know what it's, you can't know what a PhD is like until you're doing it. So once you're in it, you go, wow, is this what I want to do? Because it's like so hard. Um, but I think the PhD has been a really good experience for me because I think once you've done a PhD, 
you're ready for you're sort of ready for anything i feel like i'm now equipped to take on all kinds of research tasks i mean the fact of doing postdoctoral work in a range of different fields you know like going and doing an ethnography of a climate change research institute at uct for example an area i've never worked in but i could bring my training from my phd into that arena and produce something good that got a high level publication out of it or i can go to the african center for cities or i can be part of humor because the PhD experience equips you to do that. So it's this kind of mammoth project um, that you would otherwise not have the opportunity to, to prove yourself in. Um, I also feel like mentioning that, you know, I come from, my dad was an, is, is an academic or was an academic. So he, I grew up with him doing his PhD and then working as a lecturer for decades. So I think right from when I was a child, I had this familiarity with the university and feeling like this is a path that I could be on because I could see my dad doing it. And I could see that he was really derived a lot of enjoyment out of doing it. So I, th I think I always saw that it was a path that it was avail available to me. And there've also been breaks of several years between each of my degrees. So after my undergraduate degree, I spent a few years being a nightclub promoter and a DJ and doing all kinds of projects before I did my master's. And after my master's, it was about three years of doing art projects and doing teaching before I did my PhD. So in each time, I haven't just followed one step to the next in an academic environment. I've gone out into the world, done things I'm interested in, and it's specifically the things that I've got interested in out in the world, which have motivated me to go back into the academy and learn more about it and gain, uh, gain knowledge and credibility within the institution. And then I go out again um, and apply that in the world. So I think that's part of what I also would really like to, to play on and was at the beginning of my presentation is this idea of what's the context in the world for the academic work that we do? You know, what's our experience of the world that leads us to ask questions that we feel are worth pursuing and worth answering. So, so perhaps the PhD is valuable, you know, on a personal level to challenge yourself to go deeper into those questions and issues that we really want to go into because of the things we see in the world. That's my, that's my ideal for academic practice, I think, is how can we make a difference in the world and use the academic uh, sphere as a way to, to do that in a really insightful manner. So, thank you so much for for this answer. Very very honest and, and and complete. And you know, to for pointing out like the the many different reasons why you, as an individual and and you know, as uh, yeah, and and in general, why PhD are are valuable. Um, so, uh, do we have? Uh, a final question from from the audience. I, I feel like I have asked many many questions, um, and I feel lucky, <laughs> but I feel also selfish. Um, I know that I'm going to have other opportunities to um, to ask plenty plenty of questions to uh, to my colleague uh, Ralph. So, if you have one more question to ask, I'll, I'll let you. Um, Okay, so we have we have another another question from Divine, uh, with asking uh, what was the most difficult part of the journey. Um, I think the most difficult part of the journey was actually probably the 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 context around my work in that I'd moved to Dublin, uh, was living in Ireland, and I'm interested in Ireland, but I'd never been there, never been there before. And I, I really struggled with the weather and the environment. It's like, you know, the, I got depressed because of the, like, the lack of sunlight. Um, I ran out of money because like my scholarships weren't enough to really like live on. And so I think my low points were probably in my second year or so where I, where I didn't have money felt depressed at the environment. Um, and I went and got a, actually what helped me to get out of it. And I was thinking about this, about this presentation is this aspect of work that I went in to a temping agency and I got a job working in a janitorial company, like a cleaning services company where I was answering the phones and taking orders. And I'd go and do that for, um, in the mornings, you know, for, for, for several months. And I earned enough from that to pay for my, pay for my living. 
Um, and that reduced the stress that I was feeling financially because I'd been trying to just focus on my studies and just be a student. And I, I realized I actually needed to make some money. Um, and so again, this idea of, of work, work is challenging, but it's also enabling. So the fact that I could go off to this like job that had nothing to do with what I was studying and it was quite a menial job, but it made me, it, it enabled me to live. That really lifted me up actually, it made me feel more capable uh, in what I was doing. Um, and it was when I got teaching gigs that paid me, that again, gave me an income, but did it in a way that was more aligned with my interests that re that also really enabled me. So yeah, low points are probably what a lot of us experience, which is money is a big one. You know, do you have enough money? Can you make a living? How are you going to make money? How are you going to use your time in order to make a living as well as study? Um, and where are you? Are you a stranger in a new place? And do you feel, find that stressful? Um, or you know, are you going to make relationships that are really valuable, which is what happened in the end, of course, you know, I got a great community of people there. So yeah, I think those are some of the common common challenges and some of the, the challenges that I experienced. Thank you. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a last question in the chat um, from from Olga, and I think it's kind of like, you know, the other side of what you just said. And uh, Olga's question is how important is an inspiring environment? So I guess hmm. in a way you'd say good weather, yeah. money and, and good friends, yeah. but I let you yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that doesn't just apply to the PhD process. It's like, that's like, that's, uh, that's life. But um, yeah, for my, for my master's, I was in New York um, and New York is such a stimulating city that that provided its own, you know, its own stimulus, but it was also stressful, you know, like a big city um, can also be a stressful environment. So I'd say an inspiring environment is, um, is really important, but perhaps we can find inspiration in different ways. So in, and I struggled with the weather, the climate, like a really big thing, uh, you know, almost a surprisingly big thing the, in terms of its impact, but it's the people that really got me. So I, I love I, music scene, amazing people, um, the culture and the, the generosity and the friendship there is, is amazing. So, um, yeah, you've got to look for that inspiration, I guess. You've got in, no, nowhere is going to be perfect, but you can find, perhaps find those things that are inspiring about where you are. Yes. Yes. And, and we've seen like the images where, you know, you started with, you know, the, the protests and your involvement in them and, and you know, the, even the gears, the, the different um, of the different protesters. I think that's always also kind of an answer of this question that was literally what you presented as inspiration for your for yes. anti journey. Yes, absolutely. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ralph, for uh, such, you know, providing a very inspiring environment for us today. Um, that you. was uh, fascinating. And I, 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 I feel that we, we learn a lot from like a, a unique combination of, of talent and, and experience, experience and, and really also a, a, life, a life journey. Um, so thank you so much for your generosity and your presence today. Um, thank you, Doug. Yes, and I, want to, I also want to, uh, to say thank you um, to, my, uh, to the co-convener co co of this uh, doctoral uh, series, um, Angelique Thomas. Um, thank you so much. In two weeks, we will have uh, Arnaud Yombo. Um, he's going to, um, to, to share um, his research process also um, about the secession war. Uh, in Cameroon, I think. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> this is a moment of correcting me if I'm saying anything, anything wrong, but we'll announce um, the, the seminar properly. It's going to be on the 1st of September. So please uh, stay tuned. Um, I also would want to announce, um, to announce the release of uh, the first podcast of, um, of the excuse me, sorry, the Publishing Africa podcast series in collaboration with, with LASPAD UGB, uh, Université Gaston Berger in Senegal, and funded by Open Society Foundation. So uh, you will uh, probably find it um, on the Yuma website and on our social media. Uh, Divine, is that, is that right? Is that where we find the, the podcast? Correct. Okay. So please, uh, yeah. 
share, share, share and, and listen to it. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be extremely uh, interesting. So thank you all. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Divine. Thank you, Angelique. And thank you, everybody in the audience. And see you, see you very soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.